Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome back to the Ilmfi podcast. I'm your host, Shabir Hassan. And uh, today we've got uh, really, I think for the first time, not for the first time actually, we have had two guests on before, no doubt. We haven't had two guests on for a while. Um, but I guess the discussion that we're going to be having today is something which is really at the forefront of everybody's minds right now. Right, not just in the UK, but pretty much worldwide. Um, 2020 was a year, really, which it was dominant. Mm -hmm. Lines were dominated uh, by COVID, no doubt. You know, perhaps many of us have, you know, sadly lost um, some of our close ones due to COVID. Maybe some of us have actually experienced it ourselves. And now we're kind of uh, after many lockdowns globally, and 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 you know this worldwide pandemic, I guess now the discussion moves on to the vaccine, all right? And that's what today's episode is going to be about. It's going to be about the vaccine and it's going to be, inshallah, hopefully most of your questions would be answered about the vaccine uh, with our guests today. So I'm going to briefly introduce them right now. We have with us someone who's already come on the podcast in the past. We discussed something completely different, right? Not COVID related. Uh, and that is, of course, um, uh, Dr. Wajid Akhtar, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for joining us again. Um, and uh, we also have with us um, a virologist, and I'll let him explain later what that exactly means. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Imran Qureshi. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum assalamu warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jazakallah khair for having me on. Barakallah fikum. Yeah, thank you to both of you for joining us. Um, I will just say from like the get go, um that because we have so many like so many questions to be answered right now um that i may be a bit like you know normally a podcast is just like a conversation that kind of flows but i may be a bit like strict today with a bit of timing and you know quick fire questions and so on um so i guess let's jump straight into it now normally what i would do is i would introduce the guests right i'd give a bit of a kind of brief introduction a bit of a small kind of biography, if you want to call it. For today's one, though, uh, the reason why I'm going to allow yourselves to uh, allow both of you to introduce yourselves is because I guess when it comes to vaccines and COVID and so on, um, people are coming across videos, they're coming across articles, they're coming across all sorts, mm -hmm. right? And maybe some of the people that are discussing these things aren't even experts. They're not really qualified to discuss. So. I guess one of the first reservations that some people may, may have is we've come onto Ilm Feed. We don't even know if these uh, lovely gentlemen joining us are really qualified to speak about these things. Do they have a background in medicine and so on? So if I could ask, firstly, Dr. Imran, um, what does it mean to be, uh, you know, a, a virologist? Uh, what does it mean to be a consultant in infectious diseases? If you don't mind just elaborating what your background is for us, please. Yes, of course. And just I'll, I'll clarify the point, actually. Um, so I'm a consultant in infection. Um, it's not that dissimilar from infectious diseases. They're more or less one of the same thing, really, in many ways. Uh, so uh, I'm a medical doctor. Um, I trained um, as that. And my specialty within medicine is dealing with infections. Um, and obviously, COVID-19 is a virus. Uh, and I'm not per se a virologist, but virology is part of my job. I, I deal with vi virology as well, although there are a different type of consultant there called virologist, but we do essentially the same thing, except they focus purely on virology and I do some more um, th th than that. Um, so, so yeah, uh, in terms of being qualified to speak about it, I'm certainly qualified to speak about COVID-19. Um, obviously, I, I'm not a, I'm not a, a, a lab doctor. I don't produce the vaccine um, yet. Obviously, I have a vested interest in the way the vaccine works and how it's useful for the community. So, from that perspective, in conjunction with obviously my specialty, um, that's the background that I bring to this conversation. Okay, brilliant. And uh, Dr. Wajid, same question for yourself, please. Jazakallah khairan. Um, before I come on to myself, uh, Imran, because he's uh, humble, mashallah, also doesn't elaborate that he is the founder of something called DAPS Global, Doctors Advancing Patient Safety. So he, he's not just someone, as all doctors have an interest in patient safety, he's someone who's actually founded an organization um, that uh, helps doctors properly 
work out strategically ways that they can increase patient safety. So on that count, I think that's quite relevant to this conversation as well. So Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, that's very myself, useful. Uh, myself, I'm a, I'm a GP, and I don't like going into credentials, but like you said, it's relevant to this conversation. Um, apart from uh, being in general practice, I'm also the chair of the National Medical uh, COVID Response Group for Muslims. So it basically is a platform that's brought together Muslim healthcare professionals from across the country, different specialities, um, whether it's infectious diseases, intensive care, hospital, out of hospital, um, different nationalities, everyone coming together, trying to give a united response for the Muslim community uh, and advice from Muslim healthcare professionals to our community. Along with that, uh, I have a degree in clinical genetics. Um, and for the last eight years, I've been teaching at the local medical school on the history of medicine and social media and medicine. And a lot of that has been to do with vaccine, the development of vaccines and the vaccine hesitancy that exists. Okay, brilliant, mashallah. Uh, and since Dr. Wajid, he filled in for Dr. Imrani. Dr. Imrani, is there anything you wanna, is, is Dr. Wajid big? There's anything you want to add to that? Well, I mean, I, I, it would be, I think we'd be here for about <laughs> half an hour just talking about what this is. Other than the fact that we both studied the same medical school many, many years ago, uh, but Wajid has, uh, you know, in his capacity as B man, obviously coordinating the response from that. I, I know very few people who have spent as many hours trying to help. Uh, the Muslim Ummah from this perspective, particularly in terms of COVID, not least that he founded the the, the global charity week and mashallah, all the wonderful things that happened. But certainly with regards to COVID-19, I think mashallah, he's been one of uh, the, the, the Muslims at the forefront of of, of, um, of helping the, the wider global population, not just the local uh, UK one, but the, the global population, mashallah. So absolutely. Great, mashallah. Okay, so let's jump straight into it. Um, we're talking about vaccines today. And uh, one thing I just wanted to quickly mention uh, to our viewers and our listeners is, yes, we will be talking about vaccines in a lot of detail today. But from the Ilm Feed perspective, of course, you know, please do consult individually for your own case. Uh, you know, we're going to be giving a lot of general advice today and a lot of general information. But uh, specifically for yourself, please do still consult the experts do go, inshallah, if you have any concerns, please don't take this to be a blanket kind of statement from the get-go. And I will remind you of that later on as well as we get into things. So talking about vaccines, um, my first question was, I guess, um, there's a few different ones out now, right? Um, I mean, in the UK, we're hearing of, you know, many people for the first time are hearing of, you know, Pfizer, right? Uh, you've also seen uh, articles uh, in the news where, you know, Oxford, are also developing their own in the U US, they've got their own one. So first question is like, what's the difference between these? Why are some more effective? Why are some less effective? Uh, what's the differences between these vaccines? So you don't need to be too polite, just jump in, inshallah. <laughs> um, I think, you know, largely, so so the, the, when you hear the names like Pfizer and the, the Oxford and the AstraZeneca one, these are, large pharmaceutical companies who obviously are involved in the production of the vaccine. And I'm sure we'll get to this issue of Big Pharma at some point in this discussion, but let's leave that for now. Uh, you, you have to understand that when COVID-19 really started becoming a pandemic, or even obviously before that, once we realized that it was going to spread very quickly, uh, there the literally was a race to produce a, a vaccine because of the potential sort of well, the severe sort of mortality that associated with it, not least that we've had 70,000 deaths officially uh, in the UK from, from COVID-19. So uh, one thing that has happened this this time, in, in which is unlike any other sort of vaccine that we've seen before, is that there's been national, sorry, global cooperation in trying to produce vaccines very quickly. Um, and lots of sharing data, lots of sharing of information, which doesn't routinely happen because People like to keep the data to themselves so they can be at the forefront of technology, but this has been quite different in some ways. So in terms of the Pfizer vaccine, that's what's what we call an mRNA vaccine, and the the the, the Oxford one is based on a, what's called a chimpanzee adenovirus. So they're, they're slightly different ways of producing um, a, 
an antibody effect in, in people. So it's just a slightly different method of hopefully producing the same outcome. Okay. Is it true then that, you know, usually to, um, uh, you know, usually to this entire process, let's just say, takes years, right? And I guess one main concern immediately um, that stands out to a lot of people is, well, how is it that within months um, this vaccine has come out and it's been, you know, given, uh, you know, the heads up has been given and, and that's it, it's out there now. Um, what, do we, what, what would you say to that? I mean, it's a, that is a really good question and it's something that makes people worried that, wait a minute, if it normally takes 10 years and you've made this happen in 10 months, you've cut corners somewhere, haven't you? Mm. You've cut corners on safety or it's fake. But let me give you another analogy. If you're going in for a routine operation, let's say somebody needs a, a knee replacement, it's routine, it's not emergency, they need to do it. You might go and see the surgeon you, or your GP first, he'll refer you to the surgeon, then the surgeon will see you, he'll have a chat, then they'll do a scan, then the surgeon will see you back, he'll have another chat, then they'll say, right, let's go for the pre-op, then they'll book the operation. It could take six months, it could take nine months to get that operation done. But if you burst your appendix, Within nine minutes, you might be in the hospital on, in the theater and the surgeon's there with the knife. Now, would you turn around at that point and say, no, 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 this is too fast. This is, this is going too fast. I don't trust this. How did this happen? Uh, I, 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 I would feel more comfortable if it took nine months. No, because there's two different situations. One is an emergency. It's a life-threatening emergency. So you cut, to the, you cut to the chase, you go right to the front of the queue and you have people who are ready for their emergency, you have money thrown at it, everything's uh, channeled to get you because it's a life and death matter. Whereas before it might not have been as much of an emergency, there's less money, there's less people, there's less resources, there's more red tape. So what's happened in this 10 months is that the red tape has been cut out, the money has been thrown in, and it's been treated exactly like it is, it's been treated like an emergency because literally Every single day in this country alone, it's like two or three airplanes are falling out of the sky with people dying. So it's so people have got to work quickly. But I can understand why it's worrying, but that's the explanation because they have cut down the red tape. They've thrown more resources at it. Absolutely. Okay. And if I, if I could just add to that really quickly, um, and, you know, what is exactly right, the, the level of bureaucracy to, 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 to move the vaccines forward has decreased. But you have to remember that since we've been producing vaccines, technology has advanced at a massive rate. So now we can, I mean, within 10 days, I think, of the first case, we, we sequenced the genome for the, for the virus. So that would have been impossible 10, 15 years ago. But now, because of new technology, we're able to do things much faster as well. Okay, in terms of that makes that makes a lot of sense. But in terms of the actual process, um, you know, surely there must have been a point where it would have had to be have been tested on people, right? Before you just kind of like throw it out there uh, into the public domain. So who would have been tested? Would it have been a mixture of adults, children, you know, women who are pregnant, for example? Uh, what's the process behind it? Um, well, I mean, if, if we take if we take the 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 Oxford um, vaccine, so between April, so so over a seven month period, basically April of this year to November of this year, there were around twenty four odd thousand participants were enrolled in the in the vaccine trial, uh, of which um, uh, which about seven and a half thousand from the UK, about four thousand were from South America. Um, and they were basically enrolled in trial, either they were given the vaccine or they were given something slightly different um, as a control group. So, I mean, lots and lots of people, I mean, 24,000 people, whilst obviously, when, I mean, you know, the world's population is much larger, but it's not, a, it's not a small amount of people that are involved in the trial and the outcomes of that trial were, were very positive. Um, so, you know, we have tested, well, not we, the companies, sorry, who have been producing the vaccine have tested on humans and have demonstrated to be safe and largely efficacious. So, and can I may I add that on that point, um, like the Pfizer vaccine has been tested on you know forty thousand plus people. I personally have patients, quite a few, uh, who are on these programs, and I can watch their health on a daily basis. You know, they have blood tests, blood pressure. You know, I see these people. So you can, you can monitor them. And, and the, the process has been 
has been pretty amazing. It's like when the back, when the outbreak of COVID was here, they were they had loads of participants here. But when when it got worse in Brazil, suddenly because of the way that the world works now, they were able to get people in Brazil hired, and and they so they moved with the vaccine. Does you know would it have been nice? to have years of, you know, to say, let's give it three to five years and see what happens in the long run. Of course, you know, we're, mm. we, it would have been lovely to do that. Give it 10 years. But the number of people who need to die to give it those five, 10 years, it's what made them think that, right, let's do at least this much. This is in, this should be the bare minimum that we do and that, that mm. satisfies governments, that satisfies other scientists that you've done the bare minimum to show that we have tested on people. They don't test on pregnant women and children. And that isn't, that is just not part of normal bioethics in anything. You know, when, if you look at lots of drugs, they, um, the normal drugs that people would take antibiotics, they've not been tested on pregnant women or children because it's just not uh, done in that first phase. They're tested right. on adults. Okay. Yeah. Okay, fine. In in terms of like what this vaccine actually contains, we're hearing lots of different conflicting kind of reports. And I guess some are a bit concerned. They hear that, you know, let's talk about it from a general perspective, then we'll talk about it from an Islamic perspective. Uh, so from a general perspective, you know, what does what's the ingredients, if you could say, you know, some are saying it contains like aluminium and other things. Um, is that true? If so, is that is that normal protocol? Like, what what are your thoughts on that? So, uh, so there's a there's a couple of things I want to untangle here, um, because there's a little bit of what people are worried about with all vaccines and this specific these specific vaccines. Okay. So, um, and there there are different types of COVID vaccines. There these vaccines, the one that's licensed here in the UK right now is an mRNA vaccine, and uh, Imran probably might be able to explain that a little bit better, but. In the old days, you had two ways of working, uh, making a vaccine. You would either give a small dose of the actual disease to try to get your body to recognize it, but not at a level that it could really cause you any trouble. And then your body would be much ready, much more ready for when the real thing attacks. Like when you teach, teach your children that, you know, you teach them when they're small to not steal, you know, like if they, if, they, if they take someone else's toy because you don't want them when they grow older to be, you know, like to do something at a much wider level. or the other one was that you have a killed version of the vaccine. So you literally take the vaccine, you kill it, and then you introduce it to the person. And that person, again, still re has that same recognition that I can see what that is, just like you might teach someone using an example of TV, right? So they're not actually experiencing the actual disease, you know, the actual sin or whatever it is. And you say, look, look at that sin of stealing that you can see on TV, you, you know, but you just introduce the, a dead version of there. The mRNA, this is like a, a new leap in, t uh, in science where you right. don't do either of that. You just show a part of the... Uh, of the and uh, Imran could probably explain a little bit better. Oh, yeah, I mean, uh, sorry, you were, you were doing fun, what I was, uh, I was just saying. So it's a, it's a little piece of the genetic code, essentially, which is inserted in the body. It's not actually, it's it's the code of the virus. So it doesn't, it's not the actual virus. So Wajid was saying, so before we used to use um, either live or, or inactivated vac uh, viruses or bacteria to inject into the into the, the person as part of the vaccine, that would produce an antibody response. So we'd get antibodies fighting the infection that we injected into somebody and that's how we'd get immunity. But this is a completely different idea. So this is taking a small piece of genetic material. It's not actually putting the actual infection itself inside of you and allowing that piece of genetic code to produce the protein, which which then we develop antibodies again. So you're, you're not actually injecting somebody with the virus itself, which is very different to what we used to do before. Uh, okay. it's is, is that is that better then? Is that is yes. that better and more effective? In, in, in many ways, it is better. Yeah, in many ways, I mean, certainly conceptually, it's much better because you're not actually injecting somebody with with a pathogen, albeit that all of those vaccines have proven to be completely safe. Um, so, and, and just I just wanted to touch upon this point about aluminium as well. Uh, I think you know. Uh, I think people worry far too much about the minutiae of of what goes into these things. I mean, people eat tuna every day. There are, you know, pregnant women are not supposed to eat large amounts of tuna because it's got mercury in it. And if you eat enough of it, it may cause 
some potential problem, but people eat tuna all the time, you know. So this 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 concept about you know there's there's a you know there's a bias in people's minds that the vaccine is something horrible so we must look at every single minute detail of it and say oh you know why has this got aluminium in it whereas people may just eat that eat mercury every day not not really think twice about it in, in that sense and the other thing just to remember is that you know i've been asked a lot should we give the vaccine should we take the vaccine should my my parents have it and whatnot it is an it is essentially a medication like any other medication i mean there is no medication on this earth which does not have side effects. You know, not a single one. Take take methotrexate for instance. So it's a it's a disease modifying drug which is used in rheumatoid arthritis and other conditions like that. I mean, it has potential significant side effects. I mean, if you look at vaccinations in general, you get about three hundred people, three to four hundred people a year having significant side effects from vaccines. But then you have to remember that the number of people that take methotrexate is tiny. And the number of people that are vaccinated is massive. So, you know, it's 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 just about perspective, really. I mean, I think people think of numbers like that and think, oh my God, this many people died. But you have to remember, in many ways, it's just a drug like any other. Dr. Wajit, you're gonna add something? Yeah, it, again, it's about there's more aluminium in the in, in an egg or omelet that you eat than there will be in pretty much all the vaccines that you will ever have in your life. That's an example. Um, there's more formaldehyde in your inherent bloodstream as a human being than there is in a vaccine that you're going to take. There's all these kind of things. There's a there's there are some of these things which uh, I think Imran made, made a very clear point that we're not here to say vaccine or else. This is a medical up to you, but all we would like is make the decision. It's your decision. It's your body. It's your decision. But make the decision based on the right information, because if you're making the decision based on the, on, um, the wrong information, that could be harmful to you. Mm. From an Islamic perspective, then, uh, you know, there's there's certain vaccines or um, other medications out there which may contain things like pork and so on. Uh, Muslims, rightfully so, have um reservations about this and you know many scholars have said you know if if the, the need isn't there just stay away from you know such medications right look for alternatives and so on um now when it comes to covid which is very different you know it is we do we do know there's a high risk right now um are the, is there is there anything to worry about essentially for muslims in terms of the ingredients from an islamic perspective I mean, not that I've seen. Uh, I've not read anything to suggest that there is. Um, I don't know, Wajid, if you've seen anything different. Uh, so there are different types of vaccines. Uh, the one that's being rolled out right now, Pfizer BioNTech, has no animal ingredients whatsoever. And we right. have yet to find, um, uh, and remember, we're not faqis, so this is a, a sure. we can't speak for them. But we haven't found a scholar yet who said there's any that this is haram uh, right. or that you shouldn't have it. But even if it did, and there may be vaccines in the future that do, uh, there are vaccines that currently exist, and the ones in the future that do exist have material that are, um, that would normally be considered haram. Mm. It's a good example. Um, what the ulama so far, and this is worldwide across different bodies in different places, have, uh, it's it's a pretty much a, uh, the, the majority consensus is that if it's, it, it goes back to the, healthcare issue that if the healthcare professionals feel that this is important this is good important for your health then there's so many other issues that come into it is, that, is it actually still pork anymore does it have any of that you know after it's been changed so much is this necessary for your health and mm. if they're saying that it is then it's very rare to find the islamic scholar that says that it's better that your health suffers than you uh, take something which has a questionable ingredient, and they're very, very, very few that have those kind of questionable ingredients. Okay, mm -hmm. makes sense. Um, Dr. Imran, you mentioned something about mm -hmm. uh, there not really being any kind of vaccine or medication out there, uh, except that it probably does have some side effects to some to some degree, right? Um, let's talk about this particular, uh, the COVID vaccine. Um, mm -hmm. Many concerns about side effects. Um, again, it's 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 natural, right? You know, the the fear of the unknown. Right, you know, you take it. What if something happens? What if, uh, it, it, you know, it intensifies, it gets worse? So, um, are there that we know of any side effects or risks of side effects? Especially, uh, you know, the common one that we're hearing is infertility in women, right? Uh, which is, if if that's true, then you know, that's a huge thing, right? So, yeah. any side effects that we know mm -hmm. of at this point? 
Uh, no, not, I mean, other than the normal side effects that you get with all vaccines and, and, and the, the, the homogenous stool vaccine, so you may get some fever, you may feel tired or have a headache, uh, you might get a rash. In very, very rare cases, you may get full-blown anaphylaxis, or, uh, you know, uh, where you, where you find it difficult to breathe, but those are exceedingly rare cases, but that's with all vaccines, it's not just with the COVID vaccine. We are yet to find any significant side effects, particularly infertility, uh, and I don't know how people would have arrived at that conclusion when people, you know, the 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 participants of all the vaccine trials have been followed up so meticulously. And again, I understand why people, I can understand the human aspect of why people are concerned, but there has to be something which is, I mean, those concerns have to be grounded in, in scientific basis and evidence, and we haven't found any for that at the moment. And, okay. and maybe just come in on that point, because there's, there are some stories going around saying, you know, 3%, 3% of all people who have this vaccine have suffered from irreversible side effects. That's not true. That unfortunately, was uh, it's a myth. Um, 3% were so, said to have any side effect. No one, uh, uh, the, there's been six people out of about a million people who've had the vaccine so far, probably more than that, six people who had anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is basically, you know, like if you're allergic to strawberries or nuts and someone gives you one of those nuts, your face gets swollen, oh, you're breathing. Yeah. You know, that is dangerous. And six people, alhamdulillah, all who recovered, that is less than the number of people who would have had anaphylaxis if you were to give them penicillin. Mm. It gives, puts yeah. it in perspective. There's not been any long-term side effects. There have been side effects where people have had a little bit of arm pain, maybe felt a bit feverish. And, and that's about it. And what are we weighing it up against? Because uh, this happens a lot in general practice. You give a patient, hey, would you like a cholesterol tablet? And they're like, ooh, I heard those cholesterol tablets. You know those cholesterol tablets? They can cause you to have aches and pains in your arms. And I was like, sometimes, rarely they can. But did you know that one out of every three people in this country will die of a heart attack or stroke? So what's more important? the aches and pains in your arm, or the chance of this one in three people die heart strike or stroke for the cholesterol tablet, as an example. Similarly, with COVID vaccines, you, it's good to weigh up one against the other. So when you weigh up the risk of side effects, and who knows, we, there may be, we, we're, you know, we, we have to be honest and say that five years, 10 years from now, we may discover side effects in the long-term follow-up. When, you know, this is not us giving a blank check. But mm -hmm. what you weigh up the side effects to the other side, which is the number of people who are dying on a daily basis, the number of people who are having long-term side effects, the, the devastation it's causing to society as a whole, mental health effects, etc. And it's, you know, the, the balance is very, very, very much in favor of dealing with what we know to be causing damage to what we're not sure ever will. Absolutely. Okay. Completely. Yeah. Okay. Make, makes sense. Okay, fine. Um, I had uh, just another quick question, which is regarding this new strain, right, which we're all hearing about now, especially in the UK. It's, it's, it's you two, know, we're hearing that. There's two new strains. There's two new strains. Two new strains. Oh, okay. So, so there we go, right? Um, and we're hearing that it's spreading a lot quicker um, uh, and, and there's many, many other, um, it's causing a lot more detriment to health and so on. But my question is linking it back to the vaccine. Uh, let's just say someone was to take the vaccine. Right. Or if not, right, even if they didn't, the question is now with these new strains, does this render the, the, the current vaccines basically null and void? That's the question. I think it's too early to tell that um, uh, yeah. because, as you know, the, 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 the new variant has only recently been sort of isolated. Um, the, the second one that I was talking about is not actually one that we have here. It's imported from South Africa, the South African variant. Uh, so it is far too early to tell whether that's the case. But I th again, I think it's it's useful to put this in the context of another common virus, which is influenza, so flu. Uh, and you'll know that many, many people uh, have the influenza vaccine. Now, the reason that we have the influenza vaccine yearly is because some viruses undergo uh, what we call antigenic drift and shift. They they can change essentially. Let's just put it that way. It's the easiest way to understand it. And what we what we what 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 the vaccine producers do on an annual basis is to pick the three sort of most prevalent strains and incorporate them into the influenza virus. And that's why you have to have it every year. It's not like you can have the influenza virus once and you know you're okay. Uh, you have to have one every year. And my suspicion is that's what's going to happen with COVID as well. If you know when when more strains come out. So. Is will the current vaccine cover the new variant? Difficult to know for the moment until we have some more information. Um, 
Charlotte will, and if it doesn't, we may be in the situation with flu. So what we're saying is that there could be a case potentially where even though we're sitting here discussing taking the vaccine in the first place, if I decide tomorrow I am going to take the vaccine, it could be down the line with new strains, I may have to take another vaccine separate to the one I've already taken. It's very Is possible. that what we're saying? It's, okay. it's very possible. Yeah, we can't discount at the moment. But again, it's no different to, I mean, I've been having the flu vaccine for the last eight years. And can I just add on that... Um, on the point, like, if please don't think that because there's this new muta- mutation, therefore, well, there's no point taking the current vaccine mm. if, you're, if you're offered it. Uh, remember, the new mutation only affects, it's still affecting uh, a minority of people, right? In some right. areas, like where I live, it's about 50%. But in most areas, it's still not there. So it, you, you're more likely to be affected by the, the more prevalent one, number one. Number two, um, what the scientists tell us is that it should give the the current one should still protect against that, but like Imran said, we have to wait and see you know if that's a hundred percent borne out. But that's what they're saying. So there's a chance that it will protect. And number three, what option do you have? You know, like if you unless you have a different option available, then surely the option that protects you, even if it protects you against one of the three stains is better than not being protected against any of the other three. Hmm. I mean, I think, I, I think just, just to give some, and I think I completely agree with what I've just said, and just to give some more context, I mean, if you look at the number of deaths that we've had from COVID, which is 70,000 people, odd, and obviously I think it's much more than that, it's about 20,000 on top of that, probably at least. Uh, and you look at, let's go back to 2018, when we had influenza, deaths from influenza, it was around 20, 22 or 23,000, I think it was off the top of my head. I mean, that is vastly lower than COVID. And I, you know, you know, again, we're not fakis, but, you know, you know, very simple principles within the Dean about taking all precautions that you can. Uh, and especially when, you know, I'll be honest, uh, I get daily messages, WhatsApp calls, phone, you know, phone calls from friends saying, can you check on my uncle? Can you check on my dad? Can you check on my cousin? Because they're in hospital at the moment. 30 year olds, 50 year olds, 60 year olds, Beyond that, I don't see, you know, people above that don't seem to do that well at all anyway. So it is, a you know, people just say it's bad flu. It's not just bad flu. It's a completely different virus. It's not it's not the same type of virus anyway. The two different types of virus. And, and it is much worse than flu. And take it from myself and Wajid, who's, who, you know, on the front line, we see this all the time. It is it has a devastating impact. So any precautions that we can take, we should be taking them. Absolutely. But, you know, a lot of people I'm hearing are saying, you know, there's Practically, yes, of course, there, there are those who are high risk, there are those who are elderly, but generally speaking, there's like a 96, 97%, you know, recovery rate from COVID. And, you know, maybe the best way of essentially immunization is just to catch it, recover, and that way you don't even need to take a vaccine really in the first place like what's the what's the need to even take the vaccine you you, you don't we know we know we know already that you don't get persisting antibody with with uh, with normal infection so so it's, it's the same with flu if you get the flu you'll get antibody for a short period of time and then it will disappear essentially to, to to that so so people who think that you know it's 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 not the same as measles or rubella or, or chicken pox for instance where those are viruses where if you get the infection you get persisting antibody for life other than in a very very few exceptional circumstances but with this with this infection, we know that you don't get persistence of, of protection. So the vaccine has become a must, really, in my opinion. Sorry, just in my opinion, it's become a must for protection because, you know, we, we don't have lasting antibody. I've just had COVID about three weeks ago, um, and I'm waiting for maybe a month and a half before I get mine so I can lengthen my total, quote-unquote, immunity to COVID because I've already got a little bit at the moment, and we know it roughly lasts for about 60 days odd. So after that, I'll take my vaccine because then I want to be, I want to have a longer period of protection overall. Yeah. Uh, can I come back on that, uh, on this, please? The, so there are lots of messages going around right now saying, basically, listen, guys, 99.9%, you know, get better from COVID. You know, only the sick, the really sick, the really old are dying. And there's like the vaccine, which has all these, you know, potential side effects with 3%, whatever. Well, Azim, I mean, do the, people have to think before they say these statements? Number one, that whatever 0.1 percent, you don't, you know, what that translates to? For that number was wrong that they that they're quoting. In this country alone, we're right now at more than one in one thousand people who are alive in this country are now dead because of COVID. One in one thousand. 
So that's not a small number, and that's growing. We're still having, we're we're still getting like the worst of it coming through. Then they say it's the old. It's not just the old. As Imran was saying, there are younger and younger people who are also there. Just yeah. recently, in the London Hospital, was like, you know, a, a young child died from COVID. So it's not completely impossible for young people to get ill. And when they say, oh well, they are they're sick. What does sickness count as? He has asthma. He has diabetes. You know, like these are normal conditions that people should be able to live a healthy life with. But they're saying, but now others, in order to make a case to say that, oh, it's only the sick that are dying, they're saying, oh, he was 40 years old, but he had he had diabetes. So it's you know, that's fine. Oh, he was he was 35, he had asthma. Like, well, what are you talking about? These are human beings, they have families. Um, and but so it's, it, yeah. it's quite bad. It, it's not. It's not. But Waj is right. But it's not just that. We. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I'm in my capacity as an infection doctor. I, I. I have to look after some of the ITU patients as well. And there's been plenty of plenty of young thirty year olds without any preceding comorbidities, no asthma, no diabetes, nothing like that, been exceedingly sick uh, in hospital. Uh, and and not just that. People have. People don't actually understand enough about the potential long term repercussions of covid one of my one of my friends who's one of the other consultants in my hospital he caught covid quite early on but one of the things that the things that people don't know is that it can have a long term effect on your heart so the actual let's just say his 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 pumping ability of his heart has decreased quite significantly when after he caught covid and that's not uncommon we've seen that in quite a few patients so he now has to live for the rest of his life with his heart not working quite at the level it should be and he says i can't really climb up a flight of stairs without getting breathless now, you know, whereas it was fine before he had COVID. So, you know, people just, people are discussing these issues without having any understanding of the long-term implications of this illness. And they're, right. they're focusing on, on things that they have, you know, they should focus on what we do know as opposed to what we don't know. Mm. Dr. Imran, you mentioned earlier on that you think in your own opinion that it's a must, right? <laughs> Dr. Wajid, do you agree with that? Let me put it this way, brothers and sisters, the, if you want to ask, go ask. The, you don't trust us? Tell me, the, uh, the one, there's one pe person that you should trust, the grave diggers. Ask the National Burial Council. Ask the people who are digging the graves. Because that's not a made-up statistic. There's no you know, fancy numbers or whatever. It's a real person. It's a real family. Ask them if they, if they, think, if they think you should have the COVID vaccine. Ask the Hundred, the, the seventy thousand in this country, but in the you know more than a million plus. Ask the widows and the orphans and those of those kids whether they think that it was right. Ask the the the, the number of doctors who died. I mean, just today, a receiving a message saying this forty year old doctor healthy, no problems. He's on echo. That means he's you know they're keeping him alive by a machine. I uh, I lost a colleague just one week ago. Ask. All of these people, ask the people whose mental health is suffering, ask the people with the long COVID, ask the people because the economy is shutting down, uh, ask the people who have lost their jobs, their livelihoods, ask all these people whether it's a must that when, when the scientists of the world have come together, the governments, the scientists, everyone's come together, and you have different groups that are saying, this is a potentially a way out, that we say, no, there's a, there's a story uh, I, I, uh, forgive me for uh, for lengthening my response, but it makes sense. There was a man who was drowning. Who, who, there, a flood was coming. Someone knocked on his door, and they said, "A flood's coming. Come with us. We've got a boat. We can save you." He said, "No, Allah will save." You. The water came, and it took over the first floor of his house. So a boat, another boat came, and they said, "Come, we'll save you." And he said, "No, Allah will save me." The flood continued until it reached the top of his house. He was about to drown, and the third boat came, and they said, "Give me, give me your hand. We'll take you." And he said, no, Allah will save me. And he drowned. Then he went up and he asked, Allah, why didn't you save me? Allah SWT said, I sent you three boats. What more do you want? I sent you three boats. This, for, uh, in answer to your question, yes, be skeptical. Ask questions. But ask the people who know. Don't ask Google or WhatsApp. Um, if, you, if at the end of the day, you take all the information and you decide it's not for me, you know, you're, we, everyone makes their own choice. No one is forcing you. No one's got a gun to your head. But don't take false information and don't spread false information. This is what we're seeing a lot in the Muslim community because our community is not taking up this vaccine and they are dying at a higher rate than other communities. If you want to go to the hospitals in East London, 
They're, this is the, the non-Muslim people are saying that it is row after row of uh, of you know uh, Muslims uh, and in these arguments. Mm. Okay, fair enough. I, I wanted to ask a question which is a bit direct. Um, you know, me personally at this at this point, you know, I will say I haven't taken the vaccine because of all the conflicting reports and news. I am for those skeptics at this point, right? Um, my question is, I think Dr. Imran already kind of alluded to it. He said that uh, he is planning to take the vaccine himself. Dr. Wajid, have, have, are you planning to? Have you taken the vaccine I've already? Taken, or? I've taken the vaccine. I'll show you the pictures, inshallah, just to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> How long ago? Uh, just over a week ago. Okay. And you're feeling all right? Alhamdulillah, I felt fine. <laughs> like any other vaccine that you want to take. <laughs> I think my wife would question whether I was fine to, to begin with, but uh, <laughs> it was all right. <laughs> no, I'm just clarifying that, I guess, because, you know, some, some people could argue, well, you're sitting here confidently, you know, saying, yeah, the vaccine's fine, but, you know, have you taken it yourself? Yeah. You know, are you planning to take I mean, it yourself? I mean, yeah, just... just, 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 just... <laughs> Well, there's a picture. Just, just, just to reiterate why I haven't yet, and it's only because I've just had COVID, so I will have antibody, and I'm doing it to lengthen my, my, my total immunity time, not because I'm worried about it in any way. If I take it now, I know that the vaccine may only be may only work for it six to six to nine. We don't know exactly at the moment. So, if I've got antibody, I know for around sixty days after the infection, then it makes sense for me to have the vaccine at that point. So I'm extending my total. Uh, length of immunity that's the reason I've, I'm, I'm i'm holding off just for the moment but not for any other reason and on that point brothers and sisters i know people the people have suddenly become suspicious of their healthcare professionals that's what that's worrying to us right because people are naturally suspicious of politicians because you know politicians have done crazy things people are also suspicious of pharmaceutical industries and you know you're right to be suspicious because they are profit making companies but if when you become suspicious also of your ulama and of your healthcare professionals, that's dangerous in a different way because that means that you know if you you don't believe them on COVID, what will, else will you not believe them? When the doctor turns around and says you need to take this drug to help your heart, mm, are you you you're getting paid by that company, aren't you? You're making money off this. How can I trust you, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. That's what's really worrying. If you have a heart attack, you trust those guys to save your life. Right? You trust them to put a wire literally into your heart, into your blood vessels of your heart, which all they have to do is sneeze and you're gone, right? But you trust them. When you have when you need so your children need surgery, Nozabillah, you trust them with a scalpel. You're out cold. Who's gonna know? Right? Why would we suddenly become traitors to the Ummah, to our own families, because we're we're suggesting our own families to take this, to our own lives? Why would we do this? What we're saying is, brothers and sisters, is that we've looked at it, and how did we look at it? As the British Islamic Medical Association, what we did is we sat down with infectious disease specialists, virologists, uh, people who are developing vaccines, who are competing with the ones who are which have been approved. So they actually have an interest in uh, saying, don't take that vaccine because their company will get more money. Uh, people, uh, bioethicists, Islamic ethicists, uh, intensive care, all of these people. Well, we, uh, we, we a conclusion and a unanimous decision from all of them was we would take it and we would recommend our community to take it. Recommend is a key word, as you said at the beginning. This is not, you know, anyone saying that, you know, you, you must take or else it's we would really recommend because we are part of your community. We are human beings like yourself. We are Muslims like you and we want the best for our community, inshallah. We, what, you know, the crazy thing is, the crazy thing is that what we really should be angry about is that there's more vaccines being stored for the rich countries. They've bought up those vaccines. That's what we should be arguing about. We should be saying, why do you guys have all the vaccines? We should be giving the vaccines to the poor countries. But instead, what's happening is we're, <laughs> we're, we're saying we don't want the vaccine. Okay. Um, I think up until this point, we've covered you know quite, you know, quite extensively about the vaccines. There, there are a few last kind of things that I, that I did want to... Um, to ask about the vaccine itself, you know, there's lots of crazy. Uh, I say crazy, you know, to to the people who believe in it and who are who are saying it. They don't believe it's crazy, so let's. Uh, I guess we have to be fair, right? But you call it a conspiracy theory. Call it what you want. There's a lot of them out there. We've touched on a few already. Um, there's people out there that are saying this is 
you know, uh, a tool that the government are using. They're going to control you. There's, they're going to chip you, essentially, right, and stay away from the vaccine because of this. Um, you know, I kind of know what your answers are going to be right now, but uh, please, if you don't mind, just shedding some light on this. Sorry, I didn't actually catch the very last bit because my video just sort of paused for a second. What was the very last thing? Sorry. Just basically, what what are your thoughts on on that statement about the government are using this as a tool ah, to chip okay. you or control you using this vaccine? <laughs> I mean, I mean, it, it would be the grossest uh, um, uh, contravention of of our profession to do that. Really, uh, mm. we we can't operate on somebody unless we take consent from them. We can't give certain medications unless we take consent from them i mean it, it, it would it would be grievous bodily harm at the very least if we if not we if, if the government were putting microchips and processes through the vaccine i mean it is completely it it, it is a, a, a i'm sorry but it is a ridiculous conspiracy theory i mean i've never heard of anything quite i mean other than the 5g issue i've never heard of anything quite so ludicrous in my life but where did this come from right it comes from that people don't trust certain people and that's understandable like that part of that is understandable it's like look you guys messed up so badly on x y z you lied about a b c now you're telling me to trust the vaccine and what we're telling you is that you know uh what about the healthcare professionals did we lie to you did we you know where you are your doctors are we we're the ones who we're from the community and we're looking after you it doesn't make sense that muslim and non-muslim healthcare professionals Islamic scholars uh, and pharmaceutical industry and big government have all, we're all on the same page. We are actually competing interests. So mm -hmm. it's not, our, it's, in, it's in the interest of China, for example, to find a problem with the Pfizer vaccine. Because if they can do that, then, you know, it, 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 it advances their agenda. But if, so uh, on that point, all we would say is that, look, if the government wants to track you, they have different and other ways of doing it. Yeah. And unfortunately, the vaccine isn't, you know, like, the, you know, the, to, to say that it is a method of control, they would have just enforced it. They would have just said, you have to take it. Why would they even give you an option? What about DNA then? That's the other thing. Does does this vaccine end up changing DNA? Do, do we have any evidence for this? Let's just, let's just keep the answer brief. The answer is no. It, it, it physically can't. The, the, the mRNA cannot even get into the nucleus for the DNA. That's, that's a nice straightforward answer. Um, do you think at some point uh, this vaccine will become mandatory or do you think there will be cases where it is it is mandatory? For example, like tra traveling abroad? Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's, uh, uh, the, 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 so some countries do have a policy of mandatory vaccination for, for in children, for instance, in, in the United States, as an example. Uh, as far as our country is concerned, our country doesn't take that policy on on many things at all. If anything, I can't think of anything off the top of my head about the, other than lockdown or tiered systems, which have become mandatory, even though people break that all the time. Okay. Um, but uh, I can't see the vaccine, certainly in this country, being mandatory at any point. Um, but will there be potential repercussions for going to restaurants, social venues, gyms, um, you know, okay. yeah, tra traveling? Almost, I, I suspect there will be, yeah, almost certainly. That's okay. Point. Yeah, I guess it's just, you know, it's it, it makes sense. I, I can't see it happening uh, as a general kind of rule. You know, every, everybody must take the vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess with travel and things like that, I'm sure there will be some, you know, requirements, let's just say, or there'll be some restrictions, if you want to call it, when it comes to that. Um, uh, we're coming to the end now. I mean, we have discussed a lot. Uh, I really just kind of wanted to get your uh, final thoughts on this. Um, you know, again, another direct question that some people may ask is, well, you guys are doctors, you know, you are in the field of medicine and surely doctors are benefiting, if anything, from from telling people to to take the vaccine. This is some people may claim this, right? You know, are you getting money for this? You know, well, we do you are, get paid for each, we, each we shot? Are, we are definitely benefiting. The way that we're benefiting is that our patients are surviving longer and we're having to deal with less heartache. Uh, you know, I remember in the first wave standing in tears uh, at the in, in ITU because I was watching uh, a a 30 year old, not physically watching, sorry, I, was, uh, I wasn't physically watching, but I was being told standing outside that 
one of our patients who'd been looking after for the last month. He was dying. His wife was on on video cam just saying goodbye to her husband. I mean, he was really in any fit state to, to talk to her. Do we get any financial benefit from it? Do we do we get paid for shot? Not at all. Not at all. None of us get paid anything extra for advising or delivering. We have no. I certainly, I personally do not have, and I'm, I'm 100% sure Wajid doesn't have any personal connections to any pharmaceutical companies. We don't make a single penny from sitting here uh, advocating usage of the vaccine. So uh, yeah, we do benefit from the perspective of our patients. We don't benefit from financial remuneration anyway. Uh, there, there is one caveat because with, with lots of these uh, myths, they always have a little bit of truth. So they say, you know, GPs, they get paid £12.50 per shot. And that's true. But what they don't say is that the twelve pound fifty is there to cover the the cost of the venue because you can't you're not delivering it at the GP surgery, so you need to hire a, a hall or an office building or something along those lines. The cost of the nurses, the cost of the admin staff, the cost of the monitoring, the cost of the training, the cost of the needle, the syringes, and GP time eight a.m. to eight p.m. seven days a week, seven days a week, eight, eight, twelve hours. So at the end of the day, actually. Um, most GP practices, when they pay up that twelve fifty, may make a, a break even, so they might not make any money out of it, apart right. from giving their time for free. But there's a significant amount that will probably make a loss. Mm. That's interesting to know. Okay, fair enough. Um, I'm not a doctor, GP. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Doctor Imran, uh, yeah. your final thoughts uh, as we wrap up um, on on the vaccine. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, and I'm, I'm going to still watch his thunder a little bit because I think Wajid made the best point so far. Uh, you know, alhamdulillah, we are Muslimin uh, and, you know, we, are, they, they would, you know, if, if you know, we, we don't have any ulterior motive, any other vested interest other than the safety of our fellow Muslimin and obviously the wider public at large, but we're specifically within the Ilmfeed Ilm podcast, this is what I'm talking about. So, uh you know, in, in every other situation, what is right, you 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 give us your trust. We we look after you in, in every other single way. And we would not be advocating this. I would not be advocating this to my, my parents, the, to the parents of my friends, if I didn't feel that the, the safety was acceptable and that the long that the the the, the, the maslaha was greater than the mafsada, if that's the best way to put it. So so that's that's really where I sit and and I would wholeheartedly, sincerely advocate this to others. And of course, at the end, it's your decision. But, um, you know, we, this is something we need to do together. Uh, and, and taking the vaccine is, is one of those things that we need to do. Zakla. Dr. Wajid, concluding thoughts? Zakla, uh, same as Imran. Brothers and sisters, it's, uh, it's over to you. Please take the information, but take it from a trusted source. The, there's so many, unfortunately, lies on WhatsApp. It's shocking. The amount of abuse that we're getting as doctors, uh, it, you guys won't even imagine the intimidation, the abuse, personal abuse that we're getting is is unbelievable. There's a lot of that uh, negativity out there. Go to the scholars you trust and the doctors you trust and ask them and get the information and make the choice. But be very, be under no illusion because a lot of people out there will think, I haven't seen anyone die from COVID. I don't know anyone who died from COVID. There are people dying every single night we're in this podcast for one hour approximately approximately you know several uh, uh, approximately 50 60 people probably died when this time anywhere across the world like it it's this is a pandemic and the lockdowns have reduced the number of people dying the lockdowns and all the 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 face mask and the social distancing but i fear you know, there's not many things that can make a doctor who has seen people die, who has been in tough situations, you know, multiple car crashes and, you know, the worst of things. There's not many things that makes uh, a doctor, a healthcare professional scared. I am scared for my people. I'm scared for humanity when I think what could happen if this goes all the way through and we don't stop it. You will run out of places to bury your dead. You will not be able to bury them. You will struggle. You will run out of. You will run out of uh, uh, ways to count the number of orphans that are left behind. And I know that you'll be like, "This guy's making it up." I am not. I am not. So please, when we say that we are worried, 
And this may be one of the tools. The mask still remains a tool. The hand washing is still a tool. That this may be one tool. It's an important tool. Then take it seriously. Do your homework and consider it. Because the alternative is very, very, very serious indeed. Jazakallah khair to both of you, Dr. Imran, Dr. Wajid, for your time. Thank you so much uh, for, for enlightening our viewers and listeners. Uh, again, we will reiterate uh, to our Ilmfeed family across the world who are listening um, that, you know, this podcast, you know, in terms of ilm feed from our perspective, uh, we aren't pro, we aren't against, we're not saying do it, we're not saying don't do it. It's ultimately your decision. We've covered lots of different areas today. Um, please do your own research. Please consult with the experts. If you yourself are suffering, then you do need to go locally to your GP, to the doctors, you need to consult with the professionals, inshallah. From our perspective, our job was to relay the information, inshallah, from, from what we hope are reliable, authentic, you know, trustworthy sources, inshallah. Um, but the decision is ultimately yours. But we do ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us all, to keep us all healthy mm -hmm. and safe, and to make things easy for us um, as we now enter this, you know, new year. Hopefully, inshallah, may Allah. Uh, keep us all all healthy and, and grant us what is best ultimately. Once again, Jazakum Khair to our guests. Thank you so much. You. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Uh, take care of yourselves. From myself, Shabir, from Dr. Imran, from Dr. Wajid. Uh, until next time. Uh, and uh, we'll see you then. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.